Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless in the last days the prophet zechariah tells us israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against jerusalem zechariah 12 2 and 3 behold i will make jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against judah and jerusalem and it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. As Ramadan begins, fears are growing that the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound will once again become the site of violent clashes. Sunday night, the first prayers of the Muslim holy month were performed in peace. The Israeli government says it has no plans for extra restrictions on the site, despite the ongoing war in Gaza. This year and every year, Israel will strongly safeguard the freedom of religion for all faiths at all sites in Israel, especially the Temple Mount and Al-Aqsa. The entrance of worshippers to the Temple Mount will be permitted in similar numbers to previous years. <laughs> That position did not prevent clashes from breaking out on the outskirts of the compound Sunday between Israeli police and Palestinian worshippers trying to access the site. Al-Aqsa is Islam's third holiest site. It's also sacred to Jews as the former site of ancient temples. The location is frequently the focus of clashes, including raids by Israeli police in 2022 and 2023. This morning, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is rejecting President Biden's criticism after Biden this weekend claimed that Netanyahu's policies are hurting Israel. There are new signs of tension between President Biden and Israel's Benjamin Netanyahu over the war in Gaza. The Israeli Prime Minister is pushing back against the president's comments last week when Biden said Netanyahu is hurting Israel more than he's helping. Amid the mounting humanitarian crisis in Gaza, Israel plans to invade Rafah, Hamas stronghold, but also a refuge to more than one million Palestinians. President Biden was asked if that would be a red line. It is a red line, but I'm never going to leave Israel. The defense of Israel is still critical, so there's no red line. I'm going to cut off all weapons, but there's red lines that if it crosses and you cannot have 30,000 more Palestinians dead. In response, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowed his military will go to Rafah regardless. I have a red line. You know what the red line is? That October 7th doesn't happen again. It never happens again. This week marks the start of Ramadan, the Islamic holy month, a time of prayer and fasting, but in recent years, violence as well over Israeli restrictions on accessing Muslim holy sites in Jerusalem. Summer Sinijlawi is an activist with the Palestinian political party Fatah. I wish the Americans would be able to put more pressure in the coming few days. It's a ticking bomb situation. It's a ticking time bomb. Nobody can tell you what could happen. Something will happen. Now, President Biden continues to push for a ceasefire deal in exchange for dozens of Israeli hostages still in Hamas captivity for five months. But despite that punishing Israeli ground offensive and now the beginning of Ramadan, Hamas refuses to make a deal. No ceasefire before Ramadan, the holy Islamic month that's going to begin today. Hamas is still holding 130 hostages in Gaza. Julie Stahl reports from Jerusalem on the stalemate and the growing rift between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu. President Biden said he's worried about violence in Jerusalem without a ceasefire. As Israel braces for trouble in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, known as the West Bank, and beyond during Ramadan. Muslims gathered for prayer at Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount Sunday evening, Israel repeating its pledge that it will allow Muslims from Palestinian areas to pray there. In an interview with MSNBC, President Biden said Netanyahu has the right to pursue Hamas 
but must take into account the plight of Gaza's civilians. But he must, he must, he must pay more attention to the innocent lives being lost as a consequence of the actions taken. He's hurting Israel more than helping Israel. It's contrary to what Israel stands for. And I think it's a big mistake. Netanyahu responded in an interview with Politico that his policies represent the vast majority of Israelis. They support uh, the action that we're taking to destroy the remaining uh, terrorist battalions of Hamas. And they also support my position that says that we should resoundingly reject the attempt to ram down our throats a Palestinian state. The president sent a mixed message to Israel on its plans to attack Hamas in Rafah. Biden calling it a red line, but also said the U.S. will not abandon the Jewish state. And let us stand firm with Israel that we stand against an Islamic death cult. There is nothing peaceful about Hamas. They have vowed to do this again and again and again, repeat October 7 over and over and over until Israel is wiped off the map. For all the calls of ceasefire, Hamas is still firing rockets into Israel. Now, we've got a hot mic moment from our president, President Biden, where he was bragging that he had told Netanyahu there needs to be a come to Jesus moment. The president was caught on a hot mic at the State of the Union. I'm sure you've heard about this and seen this, where he's caught saying that he wants to have a come to Jesus meeting with the prime minister. And I think we have the sound here. Let's play it. You gotta keep pushing if you feel it up. Humanitarian stuff and all this stuff. So I told him, Baby, so many people. I said, Even you all should have come to Jesus. Just... <laughs> well, my message to President Biden you need to come to Abraham moment. Abraham had his relatives taken captured. They were, they were captured, they were taken away as hostages. What did he do? What did Abraham do? He went to war. And in that war, he didn't stop until all the hostages were returned safe. That needs to be our vow for the Israeli people. We will stand with you until all the hostages are released, until Hamas unconditionally surrenders, puts down all their weapons, and Hamas is no more. That needs to be our vow. We need to stand with Israel. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God's foreign policy is pretty simple. If you bless Israel, you will be blessed. If you curse Israel, you will be cursed. We move overseas now to the Middle East, the U.S. thwarting a large-scale attack by Houthi rebels targeting ships in the Red Sea. U.K. forces releasing this video of one of its warships downing an unmanned aircraft. The U.S. and coalition forces shooting down nearly 30 drones this morning. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge has more from Jerusalem tonight. Tonight, the moment an explosive attack drone is shot down by a British warship, say UK officials, with US and coalition forces protecting commercial ships in the Red Sea, facing a large-scale attack earlier today, involving swarms of drones launched by Yemen's Houthi rebels. 28 uncrewed aircraft downed in total, says the US Navy, adding no commercial or military vessels were damaged in the attack. The Houthis stepping up attacks as the U.S. and its allies work to get more aid into Gaza by air and by sea. Today, the U.S. dropping more meals into northern Gaza, where the U.N. says hundreds of thousands of people, including many children, face potential famine. Tonight, Israel welcoming U.S. plans to build a temporary pier off Gaza's coast, saying its officials will inspect shipments of aid coming in. Tight security expected here in Jerusalem. The holy Muslim month of Ramadan beginning without a ceasefire deal in place, something President Biden predicted could be very dangerous. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17:1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, 
in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Roads ripped apart and villages engulfed in water or mud. Days of torrential rain on the island of Sumatra are taking their toll on the population. Tons of mud, rocks and uprooted trees came rolling down on Friday night into a river that burst its bank and tore through mountainside villages like this one. Tens of thousands have been forced to evacuate and as the death toll climbs, search and rescue teams are scrambling to find those still missing. In Indonesia's West Sumatra province, this is the aftermath of days of torrential rain, homes damaged and roads resembling rivers. Emergency services are scrambling to save stranded families. This is undoubtedly the worst flood in about five years. It was extraordinary and unexpected. After decades in this city, this is the first time it has been exceptionally intense. Damage to roads and bridges are making rescue difficult. As waters recede, some residents have started to clean their homes, but they are still coming to terms with the cost of the natural disaster. Thankfully, my motorcycle was saved by putting it on an elevated place. As for the rest, everything in this room was submerged by the current. More rain is forecast for coming days, and the country's weather agency has warned of the potential for more extreme weather events, such as heavy rain and storms, as the end of the monsoon season approaches. In the news these days, we read about and see devastating events, each more unusual, destructive, and unprecedented than the last. They are happening more frequently and more intensely, just as the Bible said would happen just before the return. Of Jesus Christ. These devastating events are not accidents, nor are they merely the natural cycle of things. The world is enduring events that are designed to bring about the end of days and cause us to repent. God is lifting his hand of protection from the nations of the world. No, things will never get back to normal. They will only get worse. As the birth pains continue to become more frequent and more intense, one has to wonder, how close are we to the rapture and the seven-year tribulation. Joel 115. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Tonight, extreme weather turning deadly as millions clean up from a severe storm that slammed the East Coast. Homes were submerged on New Hampshire's coast. These images recorded by Henry Swenson. If you could describe in one word some of the images that we're seeing, what word would that be? Uh, heartbreaking. And down south, Charleston, South Carolina, also hit particularly hard by the deluge. Uh, it's locked up. It's not, is it even neutral? Yeah. Some drivers were left stranded and relied on help from others to move waterlogged cars. You need a hand, man? The flooding so bad in some spots, firefighters were called out to escort people out of homes and businesses. Up the 95 corridor in Toms River, New Jersey, the downpour is just as dramatic. Pretty heavy. Winds are gusting. Wow, what a night. In Queens, New York, this backseat passenger at times looking like he was braving rough seas instead of city streets. That's crazy. The severe weather didn't just stop there. In Echo, Alabama and Southeast Georgia, the National Weather Service saying tonight, tornadoes were responsible for sections of homes being gripped to shreds and trees toppling. Psalm 107, 33 and 34. He turns rivers into a wilderness and the water springs into dry ground a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. Tunisia is grappling with a years-long drought that has devastated the country's farmlands. The North African state draws the bulk of its water from precipitation and is vulnerable 
to shortfalls in rainfall. The water shortage is alarming in Tunisia due to climate change. The long periods of drought in the summer and winter seasons, coupled with heat then cold weather, have devastated crops affecting wheat, barley and fodder production. All agricultural produce have been affected. Last week, Tunisia's government hiked the cost of drinking water by up to 16 percent as the country battles with five years of severe drought. Authorities have warned against the persistence of water scarcity that has plagued the Mediterranean and North African region for several years. Water is life. We can figure out all together what will be happening when in some country we won't have any water. So it's not only a food security, it's an international security. A new report published by the European Commission's Joint Research Center warns of severe droughts in the Maghreb region that could affect agriculture, water availability and energy consumption. As the world continues to spin out of control, we can no longer afford to ignore the truth. Almighty God, the creator of heaven, earth and all things is trying to get our attention. He is letting us know through powerful weather catastrophes and the events happening in the world around us that he is in control and he is preparing to intervene in world affairs climaxing in the return of Jesus Christ. Sudanese people on the streets of Omdurman scrambling for food. Homes and shops have long run out. Charity soup kitchens such as this one are the last resort for many. With this initiative, we help a large number of people who've been displaced and had to come here to the northern districts of Omdurman because they're safe here. We also even serve some of the residents here. We serve lunch every day and on Friday we even serve breakfast as well. At least 270 families of up to seven members each are being helped. This young man used to be the breadwinner for his family, but he lost his leg and four family members when their home was caught in the crossfire. Now he's dependent on care and his family is hungry. We've been like this for some time now. Our neighbor Otman and some people in the mosque might send some food now and then. Sometimes we only have tea for food in the morning. The UN estimates that half of the Sudanese population, that's nearly 18 million, are suffering from various degrees of food shortage. At least 5 million are facing emergency levels of hunger. The ongoing war between the army and the paramilitary rapid support forces battling to control the government has disrupted food imports as well as local production. The people suffering most are those still trapped in combat zones in the capital Khartoum, the state of Al Jazeera to the south and Darfur to the west. The nearly 8 million people who have been displaced are in a similarly dire situation. People who were forced from their homes are in extreme need for help, so we call on all humanitarian organisations to do what they can. Until such a plea is satisfactorily heeded, the suffering of millions is bound to continue. The prices of basic goods are high and many don't have a job. Almost a year of war has taken a heavy toll on the entire population. The United Nations Security Council has called for an immediate ceasefire but there's no sign the warring parties are listening. The war in Sudan has been overshadowed by other conflicts worldwide. Children have become victims of a stashing of funds by aid agencies and the shifting of focus to Ukraine and Gaza. Millions of children like Saif ad are at grave risk if the funding gap and food insecurity isn't urgently addressed. And it will be one of the worst um, hunger crises on the planet on top of one of the worst civil wars and displacement crises too. Um, but we need all governments, um, all donors to, to step up for the people of Sudan right now. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. We are fast approaching a time known as the tribulation that Jesus says will be the worst time in human history as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. We are currently witnessing events that will continue to become more frequent and more intense until God pours out his final judgments on an unbelieving and unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes the price of food being so high and scarce that it will cost a full day's wages just to barely get enough to eat as we read in Revelation 6, 5 and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, 
and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. In this prophecy, it will cost a day's wages just for a loaf of bread. We are not in the tribulation period yet, but we are getting extremely close. Luke 21:25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. To the increasingly dire situation in Haiti, and dire is a word there after a massive prison break earlier this month. This is a brutal time for the people of Port-au-Prince. Haiti's capital is now largely surrounded by criminal gangs, making an already desperate situation worse. Many can't even find basic necessities, and now the United States is evacuating non-essential personnel from its embassy. Desperation in Haiti, where UN officials say around 15,000 people have been displaced in roughly the last week amid the latest spike in gang violence. Missing from action, Prime Minister Ariel Henry, who has been staying in Puerto Rico since last Tuesday. And finally, we sign. Following his return from a diplomatic trip to Kenya to lobby for security backing. Some in Haiti's capital of Port-au-Prince, including gang leaders, have called for his ouster. In a press conference last week, feared gang boss Jimmy Cherizier said his forces would fight Henri until the last drop of blood. And on Sunday, the U.S. Southern Command confirmed the military had conducted an operation to fortify the American embassy in Port-au-Prince and evacuate non-essential personnel. The U.S. Embassy is actually located in a crossroads of about three powerful gangs. Jacqueline Charles is the Caribbean correspondent for the Miami Herald. She said Haiti is near collapse. A Port-au-Prince itself is basically landlocked by gangs that control all of the major roads out of the capital. Um, there are no international flights. There are no domestic flights to get to the north, which, you know, remains relatively calm. Chaos and panic after gunmen stormed the school in Nigeria's northwest region. Locals say assailants surrounded the facility as classes were set to begin, before abducting hundreds of pupils. A teacher leading the school assembly was kidnapped. He said he couldn't run away because students depended on him for protection. A vigilante was also killed while he was trying to scare the gunman away by shooting in the air. The kidnapping marks the second mass abduction in the West African nation in less than a week. Authorities say search and rescue teams have been deployed to find the missing children, most of them aged between 8 and 15. It's not the first time that Nigerian schools have been the targets of kidnappings for ransom. In 2014, the Boko Haram armed group abducted more than 200 schoolgirls in Borno State. And again in 2021, when fighters took more than 150 children in a raid. This as the country continues to battle an insurgency since more than a decade, with armed groups operating mainly in the northeast, targeting security forces and civilians, and displacing tens of thousands of people. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. The Houthi movement began about 30 years ago as an insurgency against the Sunni Muslim government. Armed by Iran, the Shia Muslim militia is crucial to Tehran's strategy to dominate the Middle East and control shipping lanes by restricting access to the Red Sea. Dr. Kenneth Pollack is a former CIA intelligence analyst and senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He says the Houthis share Iran's goal of destroying Israel and driving the United States and its allies out of the Middle East. The Houthis have proven themselves to be belligerent, aggressive, and convinced that violence is the best way to get what they want. They are forces of repression inside Yemen and forces of aggression beyond it. Yemen's small but growing community of Christians is among those targeted by the Houthis. Christians in this area are, are folks that were formerly um, Muslim, Muslim background believers that have converted to Christianity. Christians obviously a, a, a despised minority. Ryan Brown leads Open Doors U.S., 
His group lists Yemen as the world's fifth worst persecutor of Christians on its 2024 World Watch list. Brown explains that years of war have left the people largely dependent upon outside aid. So when shipping lanes are disrupted, food and other necessities are slow to reach Middle Eastern ports, driving up costs. And Christians, those refusing to wage jihad or engage in Islamic practices, are marginalized. Christians are often last in line um, as it relates to being able to receive the, the, the care and attention there. As war and as these things continue to escalate, that has a ripple effect, uh, an economic ripple effect. Um, it can disrupt supply chains. And so while Christians were already last in line, that line becomes even further, it becomes even elongated. And so Christians um, very much impacted by what's going on currently. Once they leave Islam and are baptized, Yemeni Christians are considered apostates. So they keep their new faith secret to avoid severe persecution and possibly death at the hands of their clan or family members. And if they're not killed for their faith, I guess they're always blamed, aren't they, uh, because of the connections to the West? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah so, they become easy targets. You know, their Al-Qaeda presence in the South, uh, the Houthi presence in the North, um, and, you know, it's uh, Christians are seen as, as enemies on all fronts there. Brown says that even though many Yemenis are frightened, they're also curious and asking questions about faith. Followers of Jesus respond with the word of God. Brown advises the body of Christ how to pray for their Yemeni brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray uh, with them that even in the midst of this conflict, that, that, that they would see peace and they would see security, but they would recognize that in, in the midst of this, this conflict, that God is doing incredible things, that his purposes are advancing and the church is advancing there. Praying they endure the suffering and remain faithful stewards of this opportunity God has given them. The Christian persecution the church is suffering right now, awful as it is, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, the greatest political leader in the history of mankind will take the world stage. He will launch a military campaign that will result in his acquiring authority over all peoples of the earth as we read in Revelation 13, 7 and 8. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. His empire will be the most extensive in all of history, encompassing the entire world, and his rule will be the most demonic the world has ever experienced. He will appear to be the savior of the world, but as he consolidates his power, his true nature will be revealed. He will emerge as a Satan-possessed, an empowered person who hates God and is determined to annihilate Christianity. His method of eliminating Christians will be by beheading as we read in Revelation 24. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. For this reason, he is identified in Scripture as the Antichrist, as we read in 1 John 2.18. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear, that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, 
we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.